much for the for the survivors who have been here. Uh, okay, just regarding the, the, the last lecture today, yesterday, I will restart again explaining about the, the Lyapunov exponents because I think that that part was not really, the sound was not recorded. So the batteries died. So let me just recall, which is a, a very naive idea. Can you, can you read it if you more or less, I think, a bit better? Okay, so a nice idea on Lyapunov exponent. Very, very naive. And my idea is just to take a defeo. So I mean, it's just taking this. And uh, what I'm interested is in the following. So we are in R. I take a point X naught. I compute the orbit. So the orbit of X naught is X naught, X one, which is F of X naught, X two, which is by notation, this, which means F composed with F X naught and, and so on, okay? And i really, what I want to know is how sensitive is my system to initial conditions. So if I start in a point which is quite close, this is delta naught, and I compute the corresponding orbit, and I compute, X, say, F n of x0 plus delta naught how far they are, okay? If they are really very far, if this distance increase a lot, uh, I have an idea that how the orbits behave close to the orbit of X naught. If this uh, distance decrease, it's like uh, the orbit which are close to the original one became closer and closer, and maybe everything is just shrinking, okay? And if more or less this distance is approximately the same, what I'm seeing is that my system is just deforming, but not really constraining or expanding, okay? So the idea is to compute this difference regarding this one here. And in order to do it, let me just put some notation. So just to, to do it in a simple way, define delta n, this distance this is the nth iterate of this point of the orbit minus the corresponding of the original and say the modulus of the distance. I take delta naught, which is the original distance, and I want to compare this. Okay. First hypothesis. So my hypothesis. Hypothesis is that let me assume, so assume that they behave in something like this. So this expansion is essentially the original one multiplied by something which is an exponential of of uh, so lambda n, which means e to the lambda n times. Really like you are multiplying by a factor e to the lambda every time you perform an iteration of your map, okay? Of course, if lambda is negative, this is constraining. If lambda is positive, it is expanding. If lambda is zero, means you are have a kind of a stability. You are close, you are not attracting, but you, are, you stay there, okay? So I want to compute this lambda. And from my naive approach, if I do this, how can I derive lambda in terms of delta n and delta naught? You just compute here and you get that lambda is approximately one over n, the logarithm of this equation. So this is the thing I want to compute 
approximately, numerically. So I'm going to, to, to produce a formula, which is very naive, that can help me to, to know which could be a possible lambda for one particular orbit. You change the orbit, the lambda can change, of course. Okay. So I think it's better if I do this. And I take this. So how to do it? Okay. So lambda is more or less one over n, the logarithm delta n over delta naught. And then just express what is the definition of delta n. This is one over n, the logarithm. This difference, which is fn, means iterate, nth iterate, x zero plus delta naught minus the same with x naught, this distance divided by delta naught. Okay. And if you re remind from your uh, first course on on, uh, on calculus, this is approximately, if I take delta not very, very small, the derivative of this function here. So this is approximately one over n, the logarithm of the derivative of this function in x naught. So just let me compute this, okay? And if you want with the modulus. To do this, just, let me assume for a while that n is equal to two. And with n equal to three, four is exactly the same. So which is the derivative of this function? Sorry, this is the derivative, okay? The derivative is a composition. So you have the typical chain rule here. And when you, fail, you do this, you have to differentiate. And again, you have f prime of x, okay? So if you just do it for x naught, this means that this derivative, say in x naught, is just f prime f x naught multiplied by f prime x naught. But f of x naught is x one. So this is f prime x one, f prime x naught. And in general, you have the same for this expression. So what you have in general, this is one over n, the logarithm of the product of these n elements. So this should be the product from zero to n plus one of derivative of this point. Okay. Just the product of this is the derivative on each iterate. If you perform this in, high, in, in higher variables, it should be the differential, okay? And then you can compute with the differential. This, but this is just very simple and naive. Uh, example. And then if you apply, which is the logarithm of a product, this is just a sum. So this is one over n, the sum of the logarithm of these derivatives. And then you get a kind of approximation for lambda. You just take lambda, so n going to infinity, you have lambda more or less approximately this limit here. Okay. So this is a, a naive formula for this, for this Lyapunov exponent. This is a, the Lyapunov exponent. Lyapunov exponent. Okay, be careful, I, I, I'm lying a lot, saying this is okay for just one dimensional map. Second, if you go in higher dimensions, you have to compute 
many of them. If the dimension of the system is n, you have n Lyapunov of exponents order. There is an order always. Okay, so it's not so easy. But this is the idea. So for uh, one map in, in one variable, it makes uh, this as a numerical idea, evidence of which is the expansion rate. This is very naive and it's good, but it's just theoretical. If you try to compute this numerically, you're going to have a lot of problems. Why? Because if you take one case with lambda, say lambda equal to two approximately, everything is multiplied by exponential. So everything grows and then you have an overflow of your system in, a, in, in just very few steps. So sometimes you have to normalize every several steps of the system of this computation. This is not the standard way you compute this uh, Lyapunov exponent. This is the theoretical one. This is just the idea. But there are many methods that are used to, to do this computation. If you want, one of them is Megno. Is one of them, but there are many, okay? And in higher dimension, which is the most important in principle is the largest, okay? But also the second one could be interesting. In the simulations yesterday, we were computing the first and the second, and both of them were positive. If there are two positive, the first two are positive, this is called an evidence of hyper chaos, okay? Usually if the largest one is positive, it's a numerical evidence that you have chaos there, a chaotic behavior. It is everything is stable, this lambda should be or negative or zero, okay? So this is regarding the discussion yesterday. I apologize because the, the batteries were dead and I didn't realize. Do you have any question concerning this? So just, just a simple idea, take into account that it is not practical for numerical purposes, but that expression there is not, is not efficient, numerically efficient. Okay, so let's just take this and go to the last part of the course. This last part will contain a philosophical uh, discussion there will be some, uh, some regards and comments about origin of life, self-organization of matter, of life matter. Uh, and then my purpose is just in, to, to stop from in cer certain moments of the discussion and say, okay, this could be interesting. And if you are applying mathematics to try to model this, be aware because this kind of matrices, this kind of function are really very interesting. And then I will provide you some references to, to work with them which is, I think is the most interesting because there are as many problems in, in, in biological modeling as people working on it, okay? So today, the topics, so the, the key words is for today, they're going to be essentially two. Hypercycles and quasi-species. And all this inside the problem of self-organization of living matter okay. so a very ancient and old question how everything is starting from an inorganic life uh, became organize it and then until arriving to the complex systems we are nowadays and we know, okay? And the references, there are many of them, but the, the ones I, I'm going to use is Egan 71, Egan and Schuster. They are the end of the slides, 77 and also, a very nice uh, short report that I love very much, which is Martin Novak's report in 92. So essentially I'm going to refer to, this, to these uh, three references along my, my talk, okay? Okay, so let's, let's, let's go. First part, uh, I will try to not to follow completely slides one part by one, but just to, to do a kind of discussion. Tell me. Oh, is somebody asking something? 
No. Is okay? I think it's okay. Cell of transition criticality. Okay, great. Whoa. There are many things. <laughs> well, if somebody is aware of the, of the chat, I will, I will appreciate very much. Okay, so uh, I think let me just to switch off this part here. Oh, okay. Something which is really interesting and is very important. And biologists and ecologists will, will say much more things than the math mathematician like, like me. But the one big problem is how living matter has decided to self-organize. How, starting from, from high organic uh, behavior, there is a jump into organic life and then simple, simple elements decide to, to become complex and complex and complex and complex. And they are able to replicate, then able to, to, to evolutionate, to evolve, and everything is, seems to, to work perfectly. I mean, if we have a couple of humans and they have a, a child, for sure, 99% of probabilities that it's not going to be a duck, it's going to be another, another human being. Why? Because there's something in, in our, in, in, in our system that prevents replication from errors, okay? So this is the, the question that uh, Manfred Egan, he was a Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1967, and Peter Schuster, they decided to, to apport, to provide a possible theory to do it. It was this period in the 70s was the period of the information theory, and everything was really, really, in his, uh, it was a hot topic in that moment. In fact, if you are reading the paper of 71 paper for Egan, the very beginning, the very first chapter, you don't know if he's referring to living matter or he's referring to information. So the question is, you have an information, you have a code, you have some, something that you want to, to, to share with other people. How you do if you want to keep the fidelity of this message, even though you are repeating it anytime. There is a very old, very old game that the analogic generations used to play, not, not you, but in our case, well, it was the, the phone game. So there was a, a queue of people, of friends, and then the first one decided to one word, and then he just said to, to the ear of the next one, to the, his neighbors, and then you repeat the experiment in the end, in a quite fast way, not really slowly, in a quite fast way. And the question is, which was the word understood the last one in the queue regarding the first one? And what's happening here is the same, this information happens in, in life. So we are replicating, we are replicators, we replicate, and of course we are not error-free. So we mutate. And with mutations, you have a kind of selection. It, a mutation is good enough. It has a higher fitness. It has more opportunities to, to survive and to be the dominant. So this is the question. How you can understand this simple game, or not so simple game? Well, so the things that he tried to answer again and then after with Schuster was, which was that prerequisites, the minimal necessary prerequisites a system had to, to, to have, to, to show in order to be stable in this sense. And they characterize them having these three properties. First one, you need to have metabolism. I mean, you have to have the, the spontaneous way to, to replicate also, and also to, to be degraded. You can degrade it, okay? Second thing, well, both formation and degradation, and this is self-reproduction. So, when I talk self-reproduction, I will refer as autocatalysis in general, okay? These are something which is autocatalytic. I can reproduce, I can replicate myself. And the third property is mutability. You cannot avoid to have this. And if you think a bit about it, mutability is very important because it's the responsible of evolution. You mutate and there are millions and millions and millions of mutations and some of them are good enough. Well, the main difference, as far as I know, between this theory of Egan, Egan and Schuster regarding other people and that, that time was that Egan was a, a fan of numerical approaches to this. 
he thought that this theory was supporting something which was very dynamical. And he just puts uh, the problem into the differential equations framework. So why don't we use differential equations to try to model these things? Not only from a biological point of view, but also introducing some maths. And this was a, a key point, in my opinion. So if you want to have the simplest possible model having these characteristics, the one that they suggested was this one here. So the first part is AI, QI minus DI. So let me write it here. So this is, this is like a very theoretical, but it's just the, the idea. I will enter into the details later. Okay, then you have a sum of these elements. Oops, sorry about that. Scale plus a function, which depends on all of them. This is, and then you can recognize in this, in this, this is a differential equation. And this is for each one of your species, okay? And it's quite reasonable. Why? Okay, AI is, it contains a part of metabolism. If you multiply AI by XI, you are replicating. And this QI is the responsible of some errors. This QI, this QI belongs to zero one. And I mean, sometimes it can happen or not. What is the meaning of this term DI? This is the degradation, so you degradate. And also this term here is responsible of what? This means there are some species XK. So is this in principle, if you want, you can think this, that if the corresponding constant here is positive, from time to time, when they replicate, they produce an XY instead of an XK by error. So they, they help this species in front of the other. Of course, this is more probable if they are close in some sense, okay? And then this part here, you can put many other things, okay? You will see, and if you want, you can consider this negative. This could be a kind of restriction if you are considering this in a finite environment. Okay, so this could be a possible uh, very wide uh, framework. Let me to be a bit more precise. And to be more precise, let me go to the Novak approach. So what about Novak approach? Before do it, an example of this, just, just let me introduce hypercycle in a very naive way. And then we go to the Novax, which is kind of a, a cooperation of a cooperative system in, in, this, in this world, possible cooperative system. You have several species. You can put X1, an X1 could be the population or could be the density, as you prefer, depending if you normalize or not. X2, X3, X10. And then you can assume, for instance, that they are connected. In which way? X1, from time to time, they can mutate and then produce X2. Or if you want, X1 helps X2. The same for this one here. So here. And then you have a cycle that you can close in this way. These kind of relations are heterocatalytic. I mean, one species helps to the other. I'm not talking about inhibiting. They could inhibit it. This is very, very useful in, in, in neuroscience. So I will put like this in Jordi's notation. Why not? Could be. In my case, they are cooperated. And even more, if there must be self-reproduction, why not to ask them to auto-replicate? So these kind of structures, which are close, they're called a hypercycle. And it's like a cooperative system in the sense, maybe each one is very simple, just, just replicates and just help to the next one. But if we are all together, we can produce a group which is stronger than if we were fighting just each one by itself. And this one 
of the final ideas of Egan. You will see when it's going to appear again. Okay, so this is a hypercycle in general. Hyper cycle. Of course, the minimum expression is this one here. X1. This is one, the simplest possible. The second simplest possible, if you want, could be x1, x2 helping each other. And then you can ask this to be autocatalytic or both, as you prefer. Okay. Observe that uh, when you introduce these connections here, essentially you are having something which is smaller. So you produce that and it's more hypercycle inside the large, the large one. This is usually called a short circuit, okay? It's a kind of subsystem. Maybe they can survive without cooperating with the other ones, okay? And this is also a hypercycle because it's, it is a closed circuit, okay? So they offer this possibility, but when express this, this possibility in, uh, in Egan's book, or Egan's, uh, well, it's, an, it's a paper, but it's a, uh, many, many pages long, so it's, it's kind of book. He's thinking not only in living matter, but he's also thinking in the theory of information. So you provide information, you just want to spread information now how your system can be more robust, okay? Let's go to, to Novak. What happened here? Well, remember that one of the points, important points before I was referring was mutability. Okay, each species, they are replicators. They replicate, okay? We replicate. So what happens, what happens if I do replication um, from time to time, I make mistakes? Well, one simple way to, to think on it is, uh, well, assume that our, our species are just, I code them. In which way? Very simple way. So for me, uh, a species, a replicator, you want a replicator, can be identified by a sequence of, you want a fixed sequence of zeros and ones. Could be, if you could, if you want, you could think about DNA and then instead of Two symbols you have four. Okay. But this is the simplest case. Zero, one, zero, 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 zero. And then assume that this is one of my sequences. If you want, I can even think that the first, very, very first one is the one with all zeros. And let me put a name. I'm going to call it master sequence. I choose this one, but it could be any other. This is not important. And then I start replicating. So this is a, a, a replicator. So it replicates many, many, many generations. And from time to time, it could happen that there is some mutation. So you have the same length. And then almost all of them remain the same. So everything is perfect, except one that change. Could be a change in a gene for instance. And then mathematically, you assign a probability. So for instance, you call Q, the probability of error-free replication. So Q in zero one is the probability of error-free replication. And then, for instance, if you want, the complementary could be mu. This could be mu defined in this way. Okay, so mu could be, is the error probability, error mutation probability. Okay, this is extremely simple model. If you want it to be a more, a bit more uh, sophisticated, you could think, okay, it's not the same. maybe it's not the same to have a mutation from zero to one than one to zero. 
and you could provide different values for the mutation in both cases, and then you could play. And the question is, when you do this, they mutate. So assume, for instance, that this could correspond to the standard flu that we have uh, one year. And then you know that these virus of the flu virus start mutating. And it creates a kind of mutator. So, so they, can, they create sequences of elements, which could be close, all of them in principle of the same length. And they have, in the end, we have a cloud of the master sequence, and then many, many, many of them, which are no far from the original one. They are very close. In this terminology, one way to compute the distance between one sequence, the other one is, okay, for instance, in this case, count the number of changes, there is just one change, and divide by the number of bits, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this should be distance one over six. This is called Hamming distance in general, okay? So when you have an organism, we have this, this virus, this flu virus, you, in the end, you don't have one master sequence. You have this master sequence plus a cloud of mutants, which are not really far in Hamming distance from the original one. Maybe some of them, or these new mutations, is much better, it has a higher fitness, is well, or is better adapted to, to life than the original one. And then you have a change. Evolution, so that's according with Novak, is a kind of uh, interaction between mutation and selection. So those mutants, which are in principle be better prepared to life regarding the original one, they're going to, to survive. They're going to be selected. They're going to be the dominant ones. Well, this cloud, this cloud of, of a species, which is called a quasi-species. So you don't have this like a species. This should be a species, a replicator. But if you take into account all this, this distribution, this is a distribution, this distribution of mutants, this is called a quasi-species. And the good point is that the evolution act on this, uh, acts on this species like a whole. So it's like a unit, okay? And this is the second concept that, uh, that was introduced in Egan and, and Schuster papers, okay? The concept of quasi species. So, what I'm going to do is, when I refer to these systems, I will talk always in terms of quasi-species. I will talk about mutations. My next point is, well, I have this system. Let me try to model in the simplest mathematical possible way uh, this, uh, this, this situation. How can I do it? And which is the elements I will, I will get, I will, I will stress. And which is, from the mathematical point of view, which is the thing, the tools I can use, okay? So let me take this part here. Again, I use the blackboard. I think it's much better. I love blackboards. I think it's, everything is slower and we can understand better. Please interrupt me anytime. There is something that you don't understand. I, I have not been clear when I have explained it. So please don't hesitate to do it. If the people at home, please do the same. I will be aware. Okay, good. For the moment, there is no, there is no, no question. So let me, let me precise in, in mathematical terms. I have replicators. Okay, so assume that you have some replicators, more, more than some replicators, I would prefer to, to call them templates. So each one of these sequences is a kind of template. So I have one, two, I, N, if you want, templates. And each one, auto-replicate. Each one replicate itself, so it's an autocatalytic uh, action with a rate 
with a win rate. So auto replication rate, A1, let me put F1, F2, F3, Fn. This, uh, this uh, replication rate is like, uh, okay, the higher is this value, the more frequent you replicate. So in some sense, you are, you are better adapted to this system. Doesn't mean that you are stronger or faster or lighter. Is the, the one that has been adapted that, that, that media in the best way in that moment. Sometimes we refer to them like fitness. This is the fitness of each replicator. And I want to formulate what's happening. So I do this. How can I control, I can reproduce the mutation? Okay, so I have a, one of these particles, yi. And I assume that just, or you want, I think you say follow the notation here, is j and i, okay? Not to, not, not to change the, the, the notation in the, in the slides. So in principle, ij replicates itself, okay? But it could be some error in the replication that produce a different template, a mutation. Let me, let me assume that this is done in a with certain probability, and I will call it q. Usually is this produce i, so it's i, j, contrary to what in mathematics we should expect. Okay, it does the contrary. This is the probability of this template mutating, producing a different template, templated i, i, okay? And then I'm going to put this everything. If I look at which is the variation produced in this system by a variable or by a species or quasi-species or template x, y, this is the, say, or the quantity, or the concentration, or the density of y, y, i, 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 this one here, okay? So this is provided by what? Well, let me put q, i, i, the error-free replication of y, y in itself. Okay, this is y, y. I think I would change the letter because y, y sounds quite freaky. Okay, so error-free, error-free replication, okay? So which is going to be the variation of the quantity of this template? It is just the sum of all the, all the species, all the templates. You have the fitness, you have the probability of having I of this, elements. So you have this, simply this, this part. Of course, there are many, many other things I have to include in the model, but this just contains this. So the part containing regarding YY is I have error-free replication. And the other one is all the errors committed by other templates and give me contribution to this one here, okay? So if I put in a, I want to, to combine Blackboard and, and, and screen. As I, told you, I, I, as I told you, I prefer always Blackboard, but I think sometimes it's much better to use both. So I can put in this way, you take a vector and this part, so this formula here, is just linear and it's just given by a matrix. And which is the matrix? This one here, F1, Q11, F1, Q21, F1, Q and one, and then the same with F2, F2, and then F, n, q, one, n, until you have this one here. Multiply by x1, x2, xn. 
and just being positive, everything provides. Of course, I have to, to subtract things, but just let me put this in this way. Okay, this is a matrix. This matrix has two characteristics, if you want. First thing regarding this matrix, all the entries in this matrix are non-negative because they are fitness and probabilities. Okay, this is something I'm going to call a non-negative matrix. Okay, which is quite simple. Second thing, if you want, you can write this matrix in the following way, Q and D. Well, Q is the matrix with only the Q terms. Q is Q11, Q1N, QN1, and QNN. It is called the mutation matrix. This is the mutation matrix. And then you have D, which is a diagonal, diagonal matrix, Fn, Fn, which is the one with the thinness. Okay, so you have this part here, you divide. So U matrix is very particular. It's the product of two matrices, one which is one of this type, and the second one is a diagonal matrix. Keep in mind this one, because it's going to be very important, okay? And then, let me go a bit fast, if not, we're going to be tomorrow still here. And then what you get is something like this. Of course, you have to subtract things. I include everything subtracting, the resources are finite, there is competition with them, etc., etc. And I put in the in the second part. So minus phi and the vector x1, xn. So this is the structure. And then uh, this is the, the form I can deal with. This is very general, but this linear part at the beginning is essentially always this one here. Mutation matrix and multiply by a fitness, fitness diagonal matrix. Okay, what can I say regarding matrices which are positive? Well, we have a very important and celebrated theorems which are one, one century old. And the first one is, this is the perron fabrenius theorem. And the first one is coming from Perron that says, okay, let me think if I write here, it's not so dark. And what is the Perron for the Perron version of this theorem? The Perron, Perron is in the one in, in 1907. And the idea is, assume you have a matrix which are all its entries strictly positive, all of them. It's not my case, I could have zeros, but all of them positive. What can I say? So first thing, there is an eigenvalue, which is real, which is positive, and which is the maximum one. So there exists, say I is positive. I will say, I will denote in this way. This means all the entries of this matrix are positive. Then there exists a unique lambda, real and positive, eigenvalue, eigenvalue of this system. First thing, second thing, for any other eigenvalue of this matrix, so for any other eigenvalue of this matrix, we have F, the modulus is strictly smaller than lambda. So it's the dominant one, is the spectral radius. The spectral radius of this matrix is lambda. And third, statement there exists an eigenvector corresponding to lambda with all its entries positive. If you think in terms of biology, this means that this uh, an eigenvector has a biological meaning. Always, always, okay? So this is very important. And this kind of results appear everywhere. You will see everywhere. Okay, so there exists U eigenvector, of lambda with positive entries. 
unfortunately, my match is not on this from this type. Ah, that's a pity. Well, no problem. There is a second version of this theorem provided by Frobenius. Uh, so I think it's 20 years approximately later that say, okay, assume that your, your matrix is not positive, but it's not negative. I mean, second case, Frobenius says this. So unfortunately, my matrix is not uh, totally positive, Frobenius. So my matrix is not negative. This is my matrix. What can I say? Can I say something similar to the previous one to Perron uh, theorem? No, unfortunately, no. I need some more particularity, some more hypothesis. And one is to be A, to be irreducible. Okay, we can define on the contrary. What does it mean that a matrix is reducible? If there is a permutation uh, matrix P, means only change rows and columns. So just reorder the terms in such a way that your matrix has this triangular expression. So you can reorder, reorder the terms in such a way that you have a, an invariant subspace, which is not the complete one, okay? Triangular half that you have a, a division in, in invariant subspaces, okay? So if you can do it, your matrix is reducible. So assume that your matrix is not, is not reducible, it's, are reducible, okay? For instance, if you think in terms of, of graphs, a graph to be uh, reducible is this one here. So you have these points here, and then they are connected in the way you prefer, okay? And then you have two more here, then they are connected. This is reducible. You have two components which are different and which are invariant. So this provides a matrix which is reducible, okay? So this is not good for us. So assume that it is not negative and irreducible. Let's well, establish Frobenius theorem. Something quite similar. So there is an eigenvalue, which is real, simple, positive, which is the largest, not really the largest. There, is, there cannot be any other eigenvalue with a modulus larger than this one. There exists also an eigenvector with positive entries related to lambda, but, but you could have other eigenvalues of the same modulus. But if you have, they are very, very particular. So the only possibility, the only change is in, in two, is that there exists a number H, a natural number, in such a way I think you have all these slides. So if you have any, any question, I can provide you and can send to you anything you, you want. In such a way that the, you have eigenvalues of this form. So are the form lambda, this is my lambda, but multiply by she h. And she h, what does it mean? It's an h root of unity. So, so it's a complex value, such a way that uh, when you put to, to the h root, it gives the unity, okay? For instance, you take h equal to, to three, so you have this, these three complex values. They are complex, okay? But the modulus is one. So they have, this modulus of this is exactly lambda, same modulus. This h is called the period. And you can say even more, if you define omega equal to two pi over h, and then if you apply this rotation, you know that multiplying by e to the i omega is just to produce a rotation in the complex domain of angle omega. So if you plot your spectrum and you apply this rotation, it's invariant by this rotation, okay? So you have something which is very geometrical. Well, so this is strong result. Is my matrix Q, uh, D, falling in this case? In principle, yes. It's not negative. Everything is at least zero or more. But if you want to deal with Q, Q is even more nicer than Q, D. Why? 
because Q is very particular kind of matrix. It's a matrix which just provides probability of happening things. And what does it mean? It means the following. So assume, for instance, that you have only three templates and you just want to compute these probabilities. Say, for instance, probability of y1 to become uh, the same to error-free replicate could be, say, one half. Why not? Then you have y1 into y2, for instance, say, one fourth. And then this must be one fourth. Why? Because they, they must sum one, or it happened one thing or the other. So when you put here, what you get is something like this. So if you sum the values, the entries of this column, it is one, because you are dividing the probability in the own possible situations. This is not only apply for, for mutants, it applies in many, many, many systems. It applies in, in graph theory, in economics, and in many, many contexts. So you just divide the possibilities. Okay, and the same for this one, and this one, and this one, and all of them. So you have a matrix with all the entries positive or non-negative in such a way that the, if you sum all the columns, it's always one. This is called an stochastic matrix. So it's a, an stochastic or Markov matrix, okay? And they have even more good properties than the, than the, the previous ones. So that's the non-negative matrices. Why? Because uh, if, you have a, if you take a vector, which is a stochastic vector, I mean, the sum of the components is equal to one and all of them are positive. It's like, a, like of dividing the probability of being in some places. And you multiply a stochastic matrix by this vector. What you get is again, one of these vectors. So, it provides, it, it transforms probability into probability. Okay, these kind of matrices are behind the original uh, page rank algorithm in Google. So the, the, the original algorithm that used Google in order to order the, the web pages is strongly based in Markov matrices. Okay, so they are really very important. It is going to solve, so you have many properties, for instance, Lambda equal to one is the this Perron Frobenius eigenvalue. It's always one and is the largest. Okay, and you can compute with this distribution. You have many good properties. Is it going to solve our problem? No, no, because in our case, remember that in our case we have uh, this phi that we cannot control, but we can do many many things taking into account these properties. So just put a line in your in your book and say, okay, be careful this particular kind of matrices are really very important. And I can use many of the properties, okay? So continue. What, uh, okay, have, mm, break, no break. I think you prefer if I go ahead and I, I can promise now saying, don't worry, I will try to, to finish five minutes before the, the, the time, but this is, uh, I'm lying for sure, so you know me. But uh, can I continue? Okay. So this is the, the first thing to have to keep in mind. Second important thing, something which is really, really, really natural, but uh, as usual, natural things are really difficult to, to believe, which is the following. You take R sequences. Okay, and you decide which is the length of these seconds. So for instance, this is my sequence, zero, one, zero, zero. And I decide to just to formalize. This is very good because you can think in terms of, uh, of uh, computing science, you can just program. And assume that this has length M. M is the length of your information. Okay, and you have zeros and one. And then Q is the probability, let me put it in this way, of no mutation. So Q is error-free 
error free replication. A mu is, is just the contrary, which is the probability of mutation. Okay. And the question is, or let me say in a different way, you have this sequence could be, for instance, a very long message that you have to translate and to replicate to other people. Very, very, very long. Do you think that the you explain or there are the change of people explaining this message is very long and the probability of mutation uh, is provided? Do you think that can be any kind of relation between the length of the information you want to transmit to spread and the probability of mutation? It seems so. If the probability of, assume that you have the probability of one third of just changing one bit in your sequence. If the length is very long and I produce, and I produce many replications, the probability of uh, finishing with a message that has nothing to do with the original one is very high. So if you want to be very, very accurate with the, with the information transmission, probably you choose something which is shorter. So it seems natural that there is a relation between the length of the information and also the mu. Okay, how are they related? Okay, let me, let me play. In which sense? I'm going to deal with two species, two replicators. So X1 and X2. And I'm going to assume that this is the master one, okay? For a while, I'm going to assume that the, there is no problem with resources. They can spread infinitely, okay? So I have A1, which is, or if you want F1, it's thinness. So the replication rate. And also you have to put here the probability of no making any mistake. So this is Q for this one, Q, 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 Q. So this is a big Q with nothing to do with the mutation matrix, but with Q equal to Q to the M. This is the probability of having a copy, final copy. You don't, don't have, you don't have any, any, any mistake in your code. Multiply by X1. Let's go for this mutant. This mutant, assume that X1 only produce X2. So you have just the master and one mutant. You could have many of them, just the simplest case. So the, co the cooperation of the, of the, the part provided by X1 is just the contrary. Should be A1, one minus Q coming here, plus assume that also this one can also replicate. So A2, X2. And that's, so this is this one here too, okay? The one on the top. Uh, I think I'm going to, I can do two things is to solve the ODE, it's a one dimensional ODE, very easy. Or yeah, let me do it. Well, if not, I skip it. I don't do it because I want to, to invest some time in the final part of the talk. So what do we have? We have the following. I have this, this system and I want to, to study which is the relation between them, okay? So which is the proportion between X1 and X2? X1 is the quantity of of master of the original sequence, X2 is the mutant. And I want to know who's going to win, who's going to, to take, to dominate the system. So I can do is just to, to change this into a, into a nice ODE to solve it. If you look for the ODE of X2 over X1, what you get is something which is very simple because it's just a linear one. Observe, you have this one here. And if you just call, W X2 over X1, you have a linear ODE, the one you solved when you when you were children. Okay. So as a well, I have a master saying this is a, in the kindergarten, you start doing this. This is not right, but uh, but okay. The, probably is the very first one ODE you solve in your ordinary differential equations course. So you can you can solve it and then you solve it. Be aware, well, be aware. There is here one case 
in the case that A2 is equal to A1Q, this term does not appear. And then you have a T. When you integrate, you have a T, okay? Which is this case. You have a T. And what I'm interested in is in this proportion. So I, in fact, will be interested in this one here, X1 over X2, which is, I have an expression for W, which is the contrary. And then I can just invert and I have this expression. I want to know which is the limit of this expression when T goes to infinity, okay? Just very simple example. Okay, you do this. So this is the first case. The first case is when exactly this constant here, A2 is equal to A1Q. And then you solve, you allow T going to infinity, and what you get is E0. Of course that X1, here is, I know here it is, here it is. X1, it grows exponentially. Absurd. This is an, an uncoupled ODE. So this one, the solution is, a, is an exponential. And you know that from here, what you get is this is something like initial condition, exponential of this value. This is positive, everything grows exponential. Okay. But observe, if you compare with X2, X2 is much higher, it's much, much larger. If you just put constraints, you say your resources are finite, obviously the one is going to dominate is X2, the mutants. So the master sequence is going to disappear and everything will be dominated by the mutant. This is the first case. Let me go to the other cases, okay? Second case, A2 minus A1Q positive. And you do the same. In that case, the, 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 the constant in the exponent just goes to, to infinity because this is positive. And then since we are interested in X1 divided by X2, observe, I think I, this is not a law and Jordi will be very angry with me. This term goes to infinity. This is a constant. And then when T goes to infinity, this goes to zero again. So in this case, in this case, again, mutants dominate. And let me go to the second case, to the other case. We have any, any hope of master sequence to, to stay there, to remain, at least to be comparable. And third case, this case here, but if this value A2 minus A1 is negative, what you have is that the exponential goes to zero. And what you get is not a limit, let me, no, a zero limit when t goes to infinity, but a constant. Okay, but a constant. So I think I'm going to, to do it in the, here in the blackboard because I think it's more natural. What does it mean? If this goes to a constant, of course, keep in mind that everything is in an infinite perfect world. If you put some restrictions, this means that the proportion will be comparable. So you are having a still master sequences. And this only happens when this is A2 minus A1Q is negative. So only, the only probability to, to, to get master sequences, this happens. But this means the Q is larger than A2 over A1 in particular. If you want this, this means A2 is smaller than this, and this is smaller as A1. So the thinness, the thinness of the second species, of the mutant, must be smaller than the thinness of the master sequence, okay? In particular. If not, we don't have any hope. But I have this. But who is Q? Q is a small Q to the M. So this means that Q must be larger than this value. M is fixed, M is the length, okay? But I'm not interested in Q. I'm interested in, in the mutation rate in mu. So this means that mu, which is one, minus Q must be smaller than this value here. Uh, 
And let me put a label here. Let me call this critical. Why critical? Let me just summarize. I have the competition of the master sequence and the mutant. I have uh, some probability of mutation, which is mu. My information is encoded in, a, in, a, in something which is length m. In order to have my master sequence to survive, the only probability, the only, the only possibility is that the mu must be smaller than this critical mu. This is called error threshold, or if you want catastrophe mutation rate. So if your length, information length is very long, the, 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 the room you, you have to leave for your mutation must be tiny, because if not, for sure, that the original information is not going to survive. So if you have a system with a given M, and then you produce mutations which are larger, larger than this mu, what's going to happen is your master sequence is going to disappear and only mutants are going to survive. And this is what is observed in this plot here. Okay, so this is what happens. Here you have, this is the, the master sequence. These are all the mutants. You iterate, this is just done with one, two, three, four, n equal to the master plus 10 mutants. You increase the, the value of mu. When it reaches this value, 0 0.3, which is the mu, critical mu, what happens? The master sequences appear and all mutants remain. Okay? So, very long information code, the probability of mutation must be tiny. Okay, and this is a problem. Why? Because we know that uh, complex systems, as our systems, have information code in very long chains of DNA, et cetera, et cetera, which are really million and million of uh, nucleotides. So there are, the information has a, hard, a very large M. So we have a very tiny room for mutation. And this is not true because we, we know that very, so systems which are very complex, they have enzymes that provide this error. So they help my uh, system not to make mistakes. So how can you combine? If you are very complex, your mu must be tiny. But on the contrary, there are complex current systems, which they're really very, very, very complicated with long information and it does not happen. So which was the, the idea suggested by Egan and Schuster? Hypercycles. One way to gain complexity is just to have simple systems with M small. So you have room for a big mu. So you are more robust against mutations and then cooperate. If we cooperate, we can have a complex system all together. And then we are much, much robust, complex than before, but we need each other in order to survive. And this was the, the theory presented by, by both of them. This is very interesting and it should be very nice. Okay, however, it has problems. And when they present the theory, just right after they present problems of this theory. Uh, several of the problems is, okay, this is a hypercycle, as I told you. It has two characteristics, which I, said, which I think I, I, I just mentioned before, but I, let me stress them. One is a short circuit. This is a short circuit. So I have a smaller hypercycle inside of the my one, okay? And this is a parasite. So it's somebody which is just living from the result, but is not providing anything to the cooperative, okay? So the problem is that the, if this was a good theory, one had to prove that these hypercycles, their stability, they are robust, even if you include a short circuit or even if you include a parasite. Uh, that was not the case. That's one of the case. In principle, it seems they are really very insistent. If you change the stability, they are not robust, they disappear. They are unstable and they, they just not produce a, a good solution for us. Okay, well, with some people here, we decided to, to, to take this problem and we, we look for cases in the parameters. So just do a, a accurate analysis of stability of systems 
having short circuits. So hypercyclers, including a short circuit or a parasite. And what was the stability? No parasite, but the short circuits. Which was the stability of the new hypercycle if you were including this aside structure? And there are many cases where they are still stable. Not always there, there is instability. So this is this part here. This part here, I'm not going to explain it because it's, it's long and it's not the case. I just put the details if you want just to have a look. What is the idea? This is my ordinary differential equation. There are here two cases. So two cases with two hyper, two short circuits. Let me just concentrate in the, in the, smaller, in the smaller one. So assume that you have, which is the more possible hypercycle with a short circuit. So this one, you have one species, this is autocatalytic, and then you have S2. Observe, this is, you want a hypercycle. This heterocatalytic relation between these two species. Remember, the action of this on this is uh, K to one, and this is just the contrary. I never understand why, but uh, this is usually people used to level in this way. If I want to introduce a possible simple uh, short circuit, one possibility is to put this. This is a short circuit. That's more possible, okay? And this is with probability K11. And I'm trying to model this, uh, this hypercycle with one short circuit and look for stability. So if I do the corresponding ODE, what you get is, is this one. So you get, let me put, this is X1, K11, X1, so replication. The part coming from X2, this is X2 only has uh, the one coming from this one. And then I introduce, which is very normal, something limiting the effort. I mean, you have to put some constraint. You can notice there is not the infinite resources. And one typical way to do it is to introduce something like this, which in my case is only this. So I normalize the current capacity to one, and I say, this must be this factor. Okay, so this prevents all these values not to leave this part. So in my case, the domain is just this part. X1, X2, one, everything lives here, essentially. I limit in the resources. And I want to add some degradation because they degradate, they die. So you can put epsilon X1 and epsilon X2. And as I told you the other day or yesterday or the first day, you could put epsilon one and epsilon two. Yes, but if I want to do an analysis, the minimum number of parameters I have, the better because I can recognize things. If not, it's too much of, can be more accurate, but I'm losing completely the, the intuition. So I love simple models, okay? So you do this. And what you can do is, as usual, uh, equilibrium points, you look for Limit cycles, there are no limit cycles because it's, it's not possible. Invariant lines, you find many, many, many things and you solve the problem. So you can do it and you can just, just compute numerically everything. This is not my point of interest. I'm going to show you one way, one parallel way to compare with this, with this model, which is uh, using a cellular automaton. We should be a cellular automaton in this way. I want to simulate this in another way in order to compare. I want to introduce some stochasticity analysis in this model, okay? This is deterministic. There is no possibility of, of variation. There is no noise. How can I introduce some, uh, some noise or some probability? Okay, I didn't want to, to erase this, but this. Well, the way to do it is the following. Let me assume that the place where they live is a grid. And I build a grid of L by L, 
for instance, L is a parameter, so you you choose. So this is L, my L grid. Okay. The good thing of this is that you can program it and you can also show it and you can uh, visualize and it's very, they are very nice. So this is a, I'm going to build a cellular automaton. Automata will be in plural, okay? So the idea is this. What I'm going to do is just to choose and to put in each cell one of these species, X1 or X2, or you want S1 or S2. It's just a, it's a game, it's like a game. So what they're going to do is the following. On each grid, I can find three things. S1 means population X1, this is X2, and this is empty. And this is like the, the life game. What I'm going to do is how they, how I allow this system to evolve. So I'm putting some rules. These rules must be quite similar to the ones provided by this system. And if everything goes correctly. This should be like the mean field. It's called the mean field, the average dynamics that I can see in this case. So I, I explain the rules of the, of the game. I have 10 minutes. I think 10 minutes I finish. Which are the rules? Okay, first thing, I have generations. So I have to is a generation. So everybody replicates, okay? And then I will choose to to be 5,000, 20,000, depends on my computer, okay? So for each, this is in mass syndromes, for each to, what I'm going to do is the following. First, I have L square uh, cells. So I'm going to do the same L square times. So this is going to be repeated L square times. Why? Because in average, I'm going to do this, this, uh, this procedure for each cell in one generation in average, okay? So in average, this, the sequences of procedure that I'm going to explain now is going to happen for each cell in average. I cannot control, this is going to be a stochastic. Okay, what are you going to do? I choose random. You have many codes with produce pseudo random uh, numbers. Be careful, pseudo random. So you have to be careful with this. And you choose one. Assume that you have chosen this one and call it level gamma of X, Y. You can call gamma to the set of cells. And then I focus myself on the so-called Moore neighborhood. The Moore neighborhood is something, something saying the neighbors. So this one, and I take it. So let me, let me take it. I think it's almost, it's, it's almost it's every, everything written here in the slide. So, but if I try like to explain here in this way. So this is gamma, X, Y, and this is uh, the corresponding more neighbor. Then choose, uh, this must be, sorry, this choice of cell must be done in an asynchronous way. So you cannot do it all at the same time. So one, 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 okay? You choose this. Then you choose two more in this neighbor. For instance, assume that you choose this one, which is going to level uh, KL, and I don't know, this one, I'm going to level as M, P, okay? Well, when you do this, I'm going to, to apply two rules. First one, which is the autocatalytic replication. I want to simulate I'm replicating, auto-replicating. And second rule, I want to apply heterocatalytic replication. So now I have I have rule number one, rules number one, which is auto replication. I'm 
I think I have some, some pictures here. They are really wonderful. Yeah, I promise to, this is just a, all regarding bifurcation. If you want to see, it can be a kind of bifurcation diagram in two variables. This is a, all bifurcations. Okay, this one here. Well, so now what you do is you open this one here, okay? If you open this one, this is the one I have selected. This is the, the original one. If you find S not, it is empty, and on the game, and you and you pass to the to the next to the next uh, choice of of a cell. So if this is S not, nothing happens. It if it is S two, nothing happens because I'm doing auto catalytic auto replication. If the only one auto replicating is S one. So assume that you have here inside S1. Then you open the second box. You open this one here. If you find which is empty, nothing happens. It is S2, nothing happens. You only apply this rule if here you have S1. Because I am auto-replicating is the probability that I find S1 and S1. And then I open this cell here, the third one. Only if this one is empty, only if this one is empty with probability. So if I have a S1 in the position XY, if I have S1 in the position KL, in the stoichiometric way should be plus a, something that, that helps me to, to auto replicate. If I find this, sorry, and I find S not in MP plus this, this uh, element that helps me to replicate, then what I have is this is the same, this is the same, KL, and then I put S1 here. So I put here S1, but with a probability. Which probability? R. One one. So I decide a uniform distribution generation uh, numbers, and I say, okay, if in, in my choice I am between zero and R one one, then I change. If not, I do nothing. So this is the probability of auto replication. This R one one should be in the ODE model, like the K one one. Okay. So now I'm simulating auto replication. If I wanted to do the same with a terror replication, uh, let me explain here because I think it's, it's not it's too, it's too long. If I want to do the second rule, second rule is heterocatalysis, if you want, heterocatalysis. Okay, you can imagine it's going to be the same, but here you have S1, here you have S2, and here is empty or you have S2, S1, empty, the same, with a probability, which is going to be R on one, one, two, or R two, one, okay? Depending on the one I chose. And this is going to be the second part. So this one here, uh, autocatalytic, here, heterocatalytic with this probability. Okay, two rules. After these two rules, I have to degradate Remember that in your system you have degradation. So how the degradation acts? My original cell, the one I have chosen, with a probability epsilon, uh, this becomes zero, as not or not. So I'm simulating the term minus epsilon x1 or minus epsilon x2. And then the difference with respect to the all these systems is that I just shake like a zero to seven. W, W07, I'm shaking the system. I produce some diffusion, which means at the very end, because this is special, this is in the space, okay? In my ODE system, I only see concentrations, but no space. So I can try to, to incorporate space. So what I do is I choose another element at random, and with some probability, I interchange them. The probability is D that I decide. And then you do this, Many, many, many times. So you choose, for instance, uh, L equal to 200. 
you do this for 5,000, 10,000 generations, and you perform this many, many times, 20 times, 30 times, and you compute the average, the mean, and also the, the standard deviation, and you produce the plot. That gives you the quantity of any species in average. Be careful, in order to compute which is the number of elements of X1, oh, no, X1, or you want S1 here, what you have to do is to count the number of S1 in all the cells and divide by the number of cells. So you have to normalize. And then you plot these, these, these quantities. And then you compare with the mean field approach. And the idea is, are they similar? And the answer is yes. So here you can compare. Those are, I think it's the, those are the, the computations done by, by the cellular automaton and the, the continuous lines are the ones provided by, by your mean field uh, approximation. So it's quite robust. So you can believe that the, you are quite close to something which is, uh, behaves well. This is one way to, to introduce stochasticity. Also, Gillespie methods there are many, many methods, but this is quite, quite simple. It does not open any door, but it's one way to have some, some intuition what is happening. Also, you incorporate special uh, behavior. For instance, I don't know if you can see on the right hand side at the, at the bottom, there are two, 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 two pictures. Each color corresponds to one species. So you could recognize if there are some structures, if there is something which is very diffuse or not. Okay, so I think this is the, the final part of my talks. Uh, I hope you have, well, enjoy partially everything I have explained to you. There are many, many, many models to do. And like my, my colleagues, we are only trying to, to show you a, a short and fast picture of different problems, saying possibilities, techniques, and okay, enjoy, because this is really very, very fun. And thank you for your attention. So thank you very much. And that's all. These are very nice. This one here is very short. This is really very short. And it's very interesting because it explains in a great way what's about uh, squash species. This. Okay, you need a couple of coffees. Yeah, this, especially this one here. <laughs> and some sandwiches. Okay, do you have any question? I will be happy to try to answer. Is anybody in the cloud having questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Emaira. If you are hearing me, thank you very much. I have also enjoyed your talk very, very much. We should repeat this, but in, in person, all, all the three speakers, four speakers. Absolutely, Thomas, <laughs> but I enjoy it very much. And I know that from my uh, group members, your talks, I mean, and the colleagues as well, were very, very useful. So I'm looking forward to meet you soon. Thanks so you're great. You are very welcome here. And also we love to, to share some Chapolin with all of you in Bilbao. So. Yes, of course. I'm now really that the situation money. hopefully <clears throat> is becoming more controlled, we can restart our presidential seminars. It will be a pleasure to receive you here in Does, On the contrary, also you can come here. So Thanks. it will be great. Thank you very much, yeah. Myra. Thank you, Thomas. Bye. Thanks to you. Bye. I don't know where to see. <laughs> okay, homework. No, no, that's one thing which is very interesting is try to compute your own cellular automaton. Okay. Your cellular automaton is very, if you like computing, it is very nice and it's not difficult. And if you have a nice graphic inter in, in interface, it is very surprising. You probably know the typical game of, of life, black and white. This is much more sophisticated. Okay. There are also methods and there are people applying this to well, to many things, but also for COVID here in, in Barcelona, that do the same, but also the elements move. Our, my grid is, is rigid. So assume that now your cell is, is one, one individual. And then with some probability, this individual can be asymptomatic regarding COVID or could be infectious or it's just susceptible. And with some probability, they meet because they move, they move. With some probability, they can just or become infections or not. So can you apply this for COVID? And it is, yes. And the idea is there are many people here applying 
this kind of, uh, they call it agents. I think it's called agents, uh, probably you know, agent-based models, okay. And this, this, but also including dynamics, they move. This is static, but they, they move. So you are just trying to simulate real life in behavior. We are going to the supermarket and we have some probability of becoming infected or not, depending if you are or not, or me. So, okay, there are many, many tools, interesting tools. Never forget about uh, algebra. Algebra sometimes is, uh, is forgotten because uh, it seems that it's very, very simple. Okay, in many things, there is some um, important algebra behind. So in differential equations, you have, uh, you have uh, uh, variational equations and many other things that provide this information regarding the Lyapunov exponents and it's totally based on, on algebra. Okay, so that's all. And you must be very hungry because you, you, you don't talk. Okay, do you have any questions? No? So I think I have to stay here. I think we can just finish this, go to lunch and then enjoy the talk of Jordi. That will be very nice for sure. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.